five United Nations climate summits, uh, including Paris, where we had the big Paris Agreement that was supposed to put the world on a path to fighting climate change. Unfortunately, we've got off that path. Uh, the, the optimism that, that was evident in Paris did not last more than a year. And I am sorry to say that the United States is largely to blame because this country um, elected Donald Trump as president and his uh, attitude toward the environment and climate change has been um, a global disaster. Uh, and, and, and so um, when the US doesn't provide leadership for, for climate action, it turns out that it doesn't happen. And so it hasn't been happening. But I have a special um, topic to try to talk about today as, as, as your teacher and I planned this. And that is to talk about climate change in connection to this pandemic that we have. Um, and that is the coronavirus, COVID-19. Is there a connection between this virus and climate change? And the answer really exists at several levels. So is there a one-to-one -one connection? Is climate change causing this virus? No, it's not. But climate change is making it worse. Climate change is contributing to the spread of this virus. And climate change will be responsible for diseases, epidemics, and pandemics to come. And I want to explain that a little bit before I show you some slides about climate change itself. So these viruses that we get actually start in animals. Uh, scientists are pretty sure that COVID-19 started in, in bats. Bats um, are able to um, generate viruses like a little factory um, and then transmit it to another animal or transmit it to people. So there is a belief that, um, that bats or a bat um, transmitted this virus to um, animals that may have been in a food market in China and that that virus was then spread to a person. This particular virus um, has, is one that we have never ever seen before. In our country, when we first heard about it, we wanted to believe that it wasn't bad. There was a lot of talk that it wasn't any different than the flu, which in the United States kills 40,000 to 60,000 people a year. It's a lot, but it's only a very small percentage of the people in the United States that get the flu. The coronavirus is three times more infectious than the flu and 10 times more deadly. And there's a reason for that that I want to explain very simply. Uh, this virus um, has a way of getting into our cells and it can't replicate unless it can take over the machinery within the cell that allows it to reproduce. It does this very efficiently. So when the virus gets into your body, um, and the only way you can contract it is um, by touching a surface that has the virus on it, or by being around someone who has it and they sneeze or they cough and there are droplets in the air. And uh, if we touch our face or our mouth or our nose or our eyes, it can, it can get into our system. As it spreads, it accumulates mostly up here, uh, in the upper, in, in, your, in your mouth and in your upper respiratory tract, okay? This is what makes it so contagious. 
You may have heard of other um, epidemics called SARS and MERS. SARS was in China about 15 years ago, and MERS was in the Middle East a little, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Those were very, very deadly viruses, but they never spread beyond China or the Middle East. That's because those viruses got very, very deep into the lungs. And the only way they could be spread is if someone was coughing very deeply and, and they expelled droplets of the virus into the air. So it was difficult to transmit. This is a very easy, easy virus to transmit. I'm gonna to try to share my screen if I hope that this will work. Okay, can, Stavi, can you see this? Yeah, we can see this. Just give me a second, just to make sure that everyone um, has understood everything. Okay. Um, so guys, if you have any questions, αν θέλετε κάτι να με ρωτήσετε στα ελληνικά, αν κάτι δεν έχετε καταλάβει, ε, μπορούμε τώρα να πούμε ένα δύο πραγματάκια και μετά μπορούμε να συνεχίσουμε. Υπάρχει κάποιος ο οποίος θα ήθελα να ρωτήσει οτιδήποτε. Κυρία, μένα βασικά δεν μου δείχνει την εικόνα. Την οθόνη τώρα. Μάλιστα. Ε, οι υπόλοιποι βλέπετε την, ε, ε, την κοινοποίηση της οθόνης που μας έχει κάνει. Ναι, ναι. 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 Ε, Θοδωρή μου, έχεις μπει από κινητό. Μάλιστα. Μήπως φταίει αυτό, θες να προσπαθήσεις. Ε, κράτα ανοιχτό για να ακούς και δοκιμάσαι να μπεις από ένα tablet ή από έναν υπολογιστή. Ή πιο εύκολα ναι. βγες και ξαναμπες στην κλίση, μπορεί να λυθεί και έτσι. Okay. Υπάρχει κάποιος ο οποίος θα ήθελε να ρωτήσει κάτι όσον αφορά όσα υπόθηκαν ως τώρα. Τα καταλαβαίνετε, είστε ok με τον ρυθμό του. Ναι, ναι, ναι. Ωραία, τέλεια. Ok, so we're good. They didn't have any questions. They understood everything, so we can carry on. Good, 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 good. Ok. I want to um, show you this, um, this world map. But I want to show you um, how well... Greece is doing. Uh, of the developed countries and of the countries in the European Union, Greece is doing a really good job of containing the virus and limiting the numbers of deaths. So if you come over here, you can see that the United States is the worst. We have so many more cases than any other country Italy used to have the most. China actually started. Um, there's some question about whether China is reporting all their cases, but leave that, we'll leave that alone for a second. We have done a horrible job of containing this virus. And um, I don't want to make this too political, but the leadership in Washington has failed the American people in such a way that these are our numbers. These are our numbers and our deaths. We have more deaths in the United States than any other country in the world. We have the best healthcare system. We have the best CDC. We should have been on top of this. Our president ignored this totally for over a month, even though his health experts were telling him we have to prepare. We didn't, and now we are suffering the consequences. But look at Greece, or let, well, look at Italy first. 165,000 confirmed cases, 21,000 deaths. Now look at Greece. This is amazing. We have fewer than 2,200 confirmed cases, 102 deaths. We have 102 deaths by noon in New York City alone every day. But if you come out, you start to see that this disease that started in China, look at that, it started here and it has spread everywhere. 
It's in all 50 states of the United States, um, and it's in almost every country in the world. So to come back to this connection with climate change, one of the issues that we're having and that we recognize is that three out of four new diseases that we see start in animals and jump to people. As the world develops, as we cut down pristine forests, particularly in the tropics, in places like Brazil, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Africa, in Indonesia, people get closer to wild animal populations. And as we get closer, the risk of transmitting a disease from an animal to a person increases. Um, we are also seeing, as a result of the loss of habitat, uh, a loss of biodiversity, which means there are fewer animal species. And when you have fewer animal species, the ones that survive are less genetically diverse. And as more species are genetically similar, they have a difficult time fighting off these diseases. So they become carriers. Stavi, do you think that's clear? Do you, do you, do you think you need to explain any of that? I think we're fine, uh, but guys, ε, είστε όλοι οκ, okay. έχετε καταλάβει τα πάντα, υπάρχει κάτι που θέλετε να ρωτήσετε. Όχι, εντάξει. Αν θέλετε να ρωτήσει κάτι, μπορείτε να μου γράψετε και στο chat, εγώ το βλέπω το ή άλλως, και εκείνη στιγμή εγώ θα διακόψω και θα το συζητήσουμε. Οκ. Okay. Κυρία. Ναι, ναι. Ε, εμένα μου ξανακόλλησα, μάλλον φταίει το Wi-Fi, ε, Κλείνω και αν μπορείτε να με ξαναβάλετε μέσα. Οκ, okay, θα δωρήμω, σε ξαναβάζω. Ναι, ναι, ναι. Έγινε. Οκ, okay, so uh, we're good to continue. Οκ. Okay. So, um, so what, what, what happens as I continue to, to tell the story of, of people uh, taking apart natural habitats and getting close to wild animals, you have this greater opportunity for the spread Of, of viruses and diseases from people, from, from animals to people. Uh, it turns out that uh, when it comes to the coronavirus, COVID-19, that cats are easily infected by this. Um, on, on the one hand, this is very dangerous because cats are a very common um, family pet. And, uh, and in places like China, cats are, um, are food, like dogs are food. Um, the good news is that because cats can contract this virus, they can be used as animal models to develop uh, drugs and a possible vaccine. So that's good. Um, We do have this problem with bats being this factory for viruses. And you will hear people say, well, let's get rid of all the bats. I want to ask a question and see if, if someone can perhaps answer this. Is that a good idea? Should we try to kill all the bats? What would happen if we killed bats? Παιδιά, θέλει κάποιος να πάρει το λόγο και να απαντήσει. Give it a try, Alexandra. Okay. Uh, so I don't think it would be a good idea because um, the, um, some uh, some uh, animals that eat bats um, they will not have food. So um, all these um, 
connection uh, will uh, be a disaster. Um, the food chain will go down, right? Yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. And we have in our country, in the United States, and I imagine it's similar in countries around the world, a lack of appreciation for how connected we are to the wild world. If we don't have bats, so you said that bats are food for other animals. That's true. But bats are one of the primary species that eat insects. One of the insects that they love to eat the most are mosquitoes. And mosquitoes, after bats and some other mammals, are one of the primary ways that diseases are spread. Malaria, which we have vaccines now for and treatments for, before we had that, malaria killed millions of people in the tropics every year. And it's all being spread by mosquitoes. So just that one example, if we don't have bats, the mosquito population would explode. And here's where climate change plays another role in making things worse. Because diseases of the tropics that used to only be here, right around the equator, as the world warms up, these mosquitoes can travel north. So um, you may have heard of the Zika virus. This is a disease that is carried by mosquitoes. And if you get bitten by a mosquito with Zika, you can become infected. Now, Zika is not as deadly as COVID-19, but it still can be a problem. But right now, we are seeing Zika virus in the Southern United States, like in Florida. That's not good. And we can link that to our warming temperatures. And this is climate change. So we have to have this um, appreciation and understanding of how this world is interconnected and that the health of, of our populations is fully dependent on the health of our planet. And right now, the health of our planet is struggling because of climate change. Okay, so I wanna see if I can move to this PowerPoint. Stavi, are we good? In terms of understanding? Yeah, we are. You understood. You understood. You understood. Zika, you heard it again. Oh, here. You understood. Επειδή αυτά τα, τα έντομα, αυτά τα, αυτά τα κουνούπια, αυτά τα μοσκίτε, τέλο πάντων, υπήρχαν σε πιο τροπικά σημεία του κόσμου, αυτό που παρατηρήσαμε τα τελευταία χρόνια είναι ότι επειδή έχει ανέβει πολύ η θερμοκρασία λόγω τη κλιματική αλλαγή και του φαινόμενου του θερμοκηπίου, ε, αυτά, αυτά τα έντομα ξαφνικά άρχισαν να εμφανίζονται στην, ε, στο, ε, στο νότιο κομμάτι τη Βόρεια Αμερική. Δηλαδή πάνω από το Μεξικό. Άρα δηλαδή μετακινήθηκαν. Άρα πλέον βρίσκονται σε περιοχές ε, πώς τώρα δεν υπήρχαν. Ε, και γι' αυτό, και αυ, αυτό είναι κάτι που τους ανησυχεί πάρα πολύ. Γιατί βλέπουμε πλέον ότι η κλιματική αλλαγή επηρεάζει και το κομμάτι των viruses, των infections κλπ. Οκ. Okay. okay, I think we're good. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, one of the things be before I start talking to you about the science of climate change, I want to say um, that the best way that you can protect yourself from the coronavirus is if you are going outside, if you are in a store, if you are around people that you don't know and you are in, in close contact, um, washing your hands with soap, just basic soap is the best thing you can do to keep from spreading this virus to yourself. 
And the reason is because of the, the way the virus is shaped. So it's this, if you've seen a picture of it, it looks like a little ball with these little um, spikes coming out of it. And, um, you know, it, it actually, it looks like the earth with spikes coming out like this. But this layer, if we imagine this as the coronavirus, this outer cell here is just made up of basic fats. They're called lipids. And these lipids are completely destroyed by the oils in soap. Simple soap, a bar of soap, dishwashing soap, anything like that. So if you wash your hands well, you will, you will clear off any virus that might be on your hands. And you wanna do that if you go out public places to stores um, where you might come in contact with the virus. The other thing is, is what you've heard, and I imagine in your country, is this idea of social distancing and staying at least six feet apart from people that you don't know. And the reason for that is scientists have determined that if a person is infected and they sneeze or they cough, that the droplets from the sneeze or cough is only gonna travel about four or five feet from their mouth. And so six feet is seen as a safe distance. Eight feet is probably safer, but, um, but six feet has been determined to, to be um, the safe distance. So please keep that in mind, uh, washing your hands regularly and staying a safe distance uh, away from others. Um, if you're in a store or a public place or outside in a park, uh, you should be fine. One more thing, this disease is killing so many people, but very, very many of them are, are older than 75 years old and have health conditions that are poor. They um, are overweight, they have diabetes, they have um, uh, threatened immune systems. And um, once this disease gets deep into their lungs, uh, their immune response causes such inflammation or swelling inside their lungs that they literally um, cannot breathe. If you are young and healthy and um, you don't smoke cigarettes and you don't have diabetes and you get this virus, you will survive. And you may not even get that sick. It takes about two weeks and you may have one or two bad days of a high fever and body aches and a shortness of breath, but eventually your immune system will defeat this virus and you will get better, just like you get better from the flu or the cold. So young people um, are at very low, low risk of contracting, no, I'm sorry, of, of dying from this disease. They can contract it very easily and you can spread it to your parents, to your grandparents who may not be as healthy as you are. That's why we have this shutdown of the global economy. So, um, so, it, so we can slow down the spread of this until we figure out how to come up with a drug or come up with a vaccine. And that's gonna be a long time. Is that clear? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Are there any questions? Θέλει κάποιος να ρωτήσει κάτι μέχρι αυτή τη στιγμή? Okay, no, we're good. We can continue. Thank you, Justin. Stavi, I do want to ask, do any of you know anyone who has the virus? Uh, guys, do you know anyone? Do you know anyone? I don't know. 
You do know? Okay. Uh, actually, a friend of my mom's is a doctor, so I don't know uh, someone that's in my family or something, but I have a doctor close to me, so. Mm, so you get to hear about everything. Yeah. Mm. Anybody else? It doesn't have to be a family member. It can be just somebody you know. Yeah. I know someone as well. Yeah, so no, not too many. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, so that's amazing. <laughs> and that is um, an illustration of how few cases you have in Greece. Mm. Um, one of my students um, has recovered from the virus. Mm. Um, several of my students have either a brother or sister or parents who are in the home who have the virus right now. So here in the United States, we all know somebody who has this virus and we're starting to know someone who has died from the virus and that's when you know um that it's that it's bad so i'm glad that in greece uh, uh you are handling this aggressively and keeping keeping the virus uh in low numbers so that's that's really really great okay so climate change, I'm going to change this, this topic. This is our Earth, and it looks very healthy from this vantage point from outer space. And um, it's an amazing place. Um, three quarters or two thirds of the world is covered with ocean. The rest is land. We're supposed to have a lot of ice up here and down here. We have a lot less now. But this is our one planet. This is the place that we need to keep healthy for the sake of us now, and certainly for the sake of your futures. This is a picture that I took in Peru, in the Andes, about five or six years ago. And what you see here is the Peruvian Amazon. Um, I, I don't see it, Justin. I don't know, guys, do you see anything else? No. no. We're no? still looking at the map. Oh, really? Oh, because I uh, put... are you trying to show the PowerPoint? Yeah, maybe um, I need to close this. Yeah, probably. Let me close this. Come back here. Stop sharing, share, and I'm here. How about that? Can, um, you see, can you see that? Right now, I don't see anything, personally. Um, do you neither. guys see? Yeah, no. we, we don't. Your screen is not shared at the moment. Um, try to do it again. Try um, stop sharing and then reshare. How about that? I'm afraid you're still not seeing it. Yeah, we don't. Um... But you did see that other map, right? We were only looking at the John Hopkins. Oh, something is going on now. Okay, All so right. now we're looking at your teams. All um, right. Now I'm going to stop speak. sharing. Now let me see if I can yeah. share. How about now? Yes, no, we can see. Yes. Yeah, we can see now. Yeah. Okay, can you see the earth? Yes. Yeah, we can. Yeah, yes. <sighs> okay, good. So, as I was saying, before you could see it, this is our earth. And uh, this is the one place that we have, and we need to take care of it because there's no other place for us to go. Um, so I want to show you this photograph that I took in Peru that I was telling you about. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. That is the Peruvian Amazon. That's the jungle. 
And those trees are incredibly important to the health of the entire planet because these trees absorb pollution or carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They are like a magnet. Whatever pollution we put up into the atmosphere, some of it stays there, some of it goes into the oceans, and both of those places, as they absorb carbon dioxide, create problems. But when it's absorbed here into our trees, into our forests and our jungles, and even into our, even in, into our uh, soil, that carbon becomes food. It becomes the process by which trees grow their leaves uh, in the process of photosynthesis. And they also expel oxygen that we need for our planet and they expel moisture. And so um, this is a photograph that I took um, high up in the Amazon in what's called a cloud forest, not a rainforest, a cloud forest. So what you are seeing is the accumulation of clouds at a very low level that will come together, rise way up in the atmosphere and create weather around the world. So it's possible that these clouds, as they rose up above Peru, caught the jet, jet stream and headed west to Greece and provided you with rain two weeks later. That's how connected we are as a planet. We depend on the tropics, these great rainforests and cloud forests around the equator in countries like Peru, Brazil, Ecuador, the Congo, Indonesia, um, all of these great rainforests do so much work for us. Um, and so we want to keep them intact as much as possible. So this is an illustration of where our pollution comes from. Can you all see that? Yes. 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 So burning fossil fuels, coal or oil or gas, produces the most pollution. But look at what's second. Agriculture, not transportation, not industry, but agriculture. Does anyone know why agriculture produces so much pollution? Guys, any ideas? Come on, don't be shy. I could also make a mistake. I'm not sure. Kosadina, do you want to try? I don't know why uh, is our uh, agriculture sector. Cristo, any ideas? No. Okay. <laughs> so remember, I just told you that that trees are so important uh, to pulling pollution from the atmosphere. What do we need a lot of in order to grow our crops and, uh, and cattle and, and other kinds of meat? We need a lot of land. And so deforestation, the cutting down of trees, particularly in places like Brazil, which is one of the number one generators of beef, they are cutting down the Amazon in order to have more land for ranches so they can grow more cows. A lot of these cows are being sent to China because China has a bottomless appetite now for meat. So that's one reason. Agriculture contributes to deforestation. And every tree that you lose, you lose that ability of that tree to be a sponge for pollution. 
But there's another problem with this guy, the cow. Cows have a very um, unique digestive system. And as they digest grass, whatever food they're eating, that, um, that food gets turned into a methane gas. And it comes out here. Most of it comes out here. Some of it comes out here. Cows are one of the leading causes of methane gas emissions. It's incredible. And methane gas is at least 20 times more damaging to the environment than carbon dioxide, which comes from burning fossil fuels. So one of the things that people will ask me is what can I do to contribute to um, improving the environment? And there's a simple answer, eat less beef. The less beef you eat, the less demand there is for cows, the fewer cows will be grown, the, the fewer trees we have to cut down, so we have cattle, and the fewer cattle that will be there to emit methane gas. Here in the United States, we have reduced our beef consumption by 20% in the last 15 years. And it has been the equivalent of taking 30 million cars off the highway every month. That's a big impact. So, so this is an illustration of where this pollution comes from and where we fit into it. And this is where we fit into it. So as I, as I said before, when we have carbon emissions, they can only go three places. Two of them are bad. So they can go up into the atmosphere and that makes the greenhouse effect worse. And I'll explain that in a minute. So, um, 45% of all emissions, almost half, go up into the atmosphere. But 27%, about a quarter, go into our oceans. And you know the impact that it's having on our oceans. Our oceans are warming. And as a result, our coral reefs are starting to die off. Coral reefs are incredibly important because about 25% of all fish life, aquatic life, depends on coral reefs. It's a place for fish to spawn, to hide from predators, and to feed and to grow. If we lose our coral reefs, we will see our fish populations plummet. Um, and then, Justin, sorry, sorry for interrupting you, but I just want to make sure they know what coral reefs okay. is. Παιδιά, uh, okay. ξέρετε τι είναι, για τι πράγμα μιλάει. Τα κοράλια. Μπράβο, mm. μιλάει για τους ε, κοραλιογενείς ε, ύφαλους, εντάξει. Οκ, okay. sorry, you can continue, thank you. Okay, okay. Here is the other place that our pollution can go, and that is into nature. And into our forests, to our soil, not just in the tropics, but in trees and plants and soils all around the world. This is a good thing. This is where we want uh, our carbon dioxide to be held because not only does it pull it from the atmosphere, but it holds it, it holds it tight, holds it in its leaves, in its limbs, in the trunks, in the roots, and then in the soil. And as long as those trees are standing and healthy, that carbon stays in place. So the more trees we have, the more natural places that we have, the more we don't disturb soils, the better the earth can take care of us. So this is a very simple graphic of what global warming is about. So I'm going to ex explain this very simply. Here's the sun. It sends its warm energy rays 
down through the atmosphere and heats the earth. Now, a lot of this heat bounces up off the earth and wants to go back up into space. But the more pollution we have, the thicker this greenhouse effect gets, okay? So I want to, I want to say that the greenhouse effect is a good thing. We need it. If we don't have a greenhouse effect, we would have the atmosphere of the moon. And as you know, there's no life on the moon <laughs> because there's no heat getting trapped. But the problem is the more carbon dioxide we put up into the atmosphere, the thicker this greenhouse effect becomes. And so when this heat comes through and tries to bounce off and go back up into space, it gets trapped. So you think of this as um, a blanket in the sky. When you are lying in bed and you um, are cold, you put on an extra blanket and you get warm. You get warm, not because your, your body temperature increases, but because you are trapping the heat of your normal body temperature. If you get too hot, you take that blanket off and heat escapes and you cool off. Unfortunately, we can't throw this blanket off. It just keeps getting worse. And that's why we continue to warm year after year. So here's your favorite president, certainly not mine. He does not believe in global warming and, um, and we are all suffering, not just the United States, but the global community is suffering as a result of his policies. But here's the thing, nature does not care what politicians think. Nature just responds to our actions. And we are seeing that all around the world with higher temperatures, sea level rise, wildfires, intense storms like we've never seen before, and the spread of diseases that we just didn't see 10, 20, 50 years ago. So this is the last um, slide that I wanna show you. And this was taken by our space agency and put together um, in an animation. And what you will see is where all, most of the pollution in the world comes from. It comes from the industrialized Northern hemisphere. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna activate this and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So here Ooh. is your months. So the two is the month. So March, and this is the date. So in the winter, the pollution accumulates in the atmosphere. And you can see that it doesn't stay in one place. It circulates all the way around the world. Look here in the South, how little pollution, the Southern hemisphere is pollution, is, is, is contributing. But here we are now in summer. And in summer, when leaves are coming out and, uh, and, and, and trees are growing, we actually see a reduction in emissions. The factories haven't closed here. They're still polluting. Cars are still being driven. Trucks are still being driven. Airplanes are being flown. It's just that these tropical forests are absorbing so much of this um, pollution. Does this help you understand why uh, carbon emissions is a global problem? And how every yes. country needs to contribute to reducing its carbon footprint. Whatever we put up into the atmosphere here ends up here. 
Whatever comes up here in China shows up here in the United States. And as we cut down more and more trees, we have less opportunity to pull that pollution from the sky. Okay. Let's... All right. So let's bring this back to this, um, to this virus. Um, you can see that climate change is something that continues to get worse. As we lose habitat and become closer to animals that carry viruses, we have more chances of becoming infected with new diseases that may or may not be as dangerous as COVID-19. But there's something very interesting happening now. Because the global economy has essentially stopped, we are projected to put 20 billion tons less of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere this year. It'll be the first time in memory that we will not be polluting more this year than last year. In China, they see blue skies now for the first time in 20 years. In big cities like Los Angeles, in Chicago, in New York, they are seeing clear skies. For all the people dying from the coronavirus, there are people that are not dying from air pollution because of asthma. I don't know that it balances out, but we have cleaner air now because the global economy has stopped. It's not a good thing, obviously, that so many people are out of work. There's a lot of suffering that's coming from that. But if there's any silver lining to what's happening, this is an illustration to world leaders about what it's going to take to fight climate change after we've effectively fight this pandemic. It's not going to be a small effort. It's going to need to be a big global effort. And we are going to have to shift away from fossil fuels into renewable energy like solar and wind and perhaps nuclear in a much bigger way if we are going to reduce the rate of warming. And if we do that, then our planet will start to heal. It's just remarkable. If we leave nature alone, she will repair herself and all the things in it. In the same way that we need bats to keep our insect population in check, we need these trees, we need primates, we need birds, we need insects, we need microbes. All of this keeps our natural areas healthy. And as those areas retain their health or become healthier, we will be healthier as a result. So there are two things that you can do. One um, is be aware of these issues and tell your friends, tell your families, and, uh, uh, and, and, and think about what you eat. It's not a big sacrifice to give up a hamburger or beef once or twice a week. You don't have to become a vegetarian, but it makes a big difference if everyone reduces their con beef consumption. The other important thing you can do, especially in a place like the United States, is vote. Because um, we have uh, politicians that have no interest in addressing the problem of climate change. And as long as they are in office, this problem will get worse. And so we have a big election coming up in November and um, it cannot be more important. This is an election, it's probably the most important election in American history since our civil war in 16, 1860. 
but it's also an important election for the world because of the nature of this administration and the damage that he's done to relationships with the European Union, countries like your own. Hopefully, this is a personal opinion, we, we will have a big change in November. And um, we will have people in Washington and in our various states that recognize that taking care of the planet means taking care of people and taking care of the economy. They all are connected. Okay, that's a lot. Thank you so much, Justin. I think we can um, perhaps um, get to the questions part. Okay. Um, so, uh, guys, um, does anyone um, want to raise a question? I mean, it can be anything. And don't, please don't be shy. <laughs> or a comment, too. If you have a comment, I'm, I'm eager to hear what you're thinking <laughs> and you're experiencing. Yeah. Anyone? Uh, I want to ask something. Uh, there's a theory on the internet that uh, the the COVID that COVID nineteen started from uh, a, a bad soup that was sold in a restaurant and the bad had the virus. In it. Do you think it's uh, it's uh, po do you think it's possible? No. There's so many um, theories about how this virus started that are. Um, not possible. And there's so many people trying to blame somebody else for what has happened naturally. And um, so this idea that the virus started in a laboratory or among people is just not scientifically plausible. Um, we have a pretty good idea that this virus started in bats and was transmitted in food markets in China. And because it's so contagious, it spread very quickly from there. So you will hear a lot of different um, theories, but I want you to uh, encourage you to look at the science and, and, and what we understand about viruses. And um, that will help you have a better understanding of, of why we have this pandemic right now. Is that helpful? Yeah, I think it was. Um, does anyone else? Does anyone else want to ask uh, anything? So I read somewhere that uh, it's about the global warming. So uh, someone said, I mean, a couple of scientists claim that uh, global, global warming has um, is something that the earth does on its own and there's a way of healing herself herself itself someday so he must have nothing to do with it that's um that also is answered by science and i want to be very clear about this because we have very many people in the united states that say the same thing that the earth has always changed in temperature and uh, that what's happening is just normal and that humans have no real impact on the global climate. What we know is that, um, is that we have had climate change back hundreds of thousands of years. We've had ice ages. We've had really warming spells. In the last 10,000 years, our global temperatures have been very stable. What we also know is that they have spiked faster than ever in the last 100 years. And that has come with the introduction of fossil fuels as energy. So I wonder if I can, I'm going to try to share my screen again, Savia, if I can come back to my PowerPoint. Come on now. Can you see this again? Yeah. Yeah, we okay. do. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So this is a really important illustration. This is going to show you 
how much carbon is in the atmosphere in parts per million? Before we burned fossil fuels, the, um, the balance of carbon in the atmosphere was about 220 to 250 parts per million. By 1979, when this chart was put together, it was already up to uh, 335 parts per million. We had a belief, scientists believed that if we ever got to this level, it would be really, really bad. Now, watch, watch this. So watch the clock in the years and see how quickly the carbon in the atmosphere is accumulating. So here we are in 19, 2001, and we passed 370. And it continues to go up, up, and up. Now watch this. Now we're going to go back tens of thousands of years. And this answers your question directly. This is science based on core samples in the Arctic where they've drilled down a thousand feet and they get little air bubbles and they can test the, the air from 10,000 years ago and they can see the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Now look at the fluctuations. This is, this is climate change before there were people. Okay, but look at the highest it got was 300 parts per million. And now we come over here. This is the last 100 years, 100 years. If you understand science and respect it, when you see a chart like this, there's no other explanation other than the climate change that we were having now is caused by the burning of fossil fuels. Otherwise, you, we never would have gotten above this level. Does that, does that help answer your question? Yeah, of course. So I, I wanna make this really clear also. Fossil fuels have been an amazing thing. They have enabled all the prosperity that we enjoy in the modern world. From the homes that we live in, the cars that we drive, the planes that we fly in, like the clothes that we wear, everything. It's just time now to shift to a new energy source because we can no longer afford to put so much more pollution up into the atmosphere and keep our planet healthy. So this isn't about calling fossil fuels bad or evil, or the people that sell fossil fuels bad or evil. What it's about is timing. And the time is now to shift away from this energy source so we can um, help the planet regain its health. Thank you, Justin. Um, I have a student who is not able to turn on his microphone. So I'm going to ask uh, his question on his behalf. Um, so um, he's asking, what would happen if COVID-19 um, evolved? I mean, I know you're not a doctor, but um, they're, they're interested in your opinion. Yeah. So um, it's a really good question. And this is a question that I've had the opportunity to speak with scientists about. So if it evolves, uh, it will make it much more difficult to come up with a drug and to come up with a vaccine. Because to come up with an effective drug, you need a virus that stays predictable and stays the same. Here's the good news. Because COVID-19 um, has an unlimited number of places of people to infect. There's very little need for it 
to evolve or change. Does that make sense? If we were all immune, like let, let's say half of us were immune from COVID-19, then that virus is going to figure out a different way to infect us. But right now, it doesn't have to. It has billions of people that it still has the opportunity to infect. The good news in that is that science has time to come up with a vaccine because COVID-19 is not going to change between now and next year when we will likely have vaccines that we will be beginning to test. Um, okay, we have another student, uh, Christo, do you want to yes. ask your question? Yeah. I, I read an article about a new planet called Kepler 1649c, who looks like Earth a lot. Do you think that we could ever live outside our planet? Savi, can you repeat that? There was an, there was an echo. Um, okay, so um, Christo, do you want to go again? Yes. I read an article about a new planet called Kepler 1649c, who looks like Earth a lot. Do you think that we could ever live outside our planet? Is that a question of can we live on another planet? If it, if it looks like ours, if it has similar characteristics, do you think that we will at some point be able to? <laughs> <laughs> Risto, if you're going, I'm, go I'm coming with you, by the way. <laughs> uh, it, um, we haven't found a planet that looks like ours. And we've been looking for a really, really long time. And uh, if there is one, it will be so far away that we couldn't get there in our lifetime. So this is why at, um, at these climate meetings that I attend every year, there is a saying that there is no plan B because there is no planet B. So it's a nice idea. And, um, and we are thinking like, can we go to the moon? and create our own atmosphere there. We, we can build structures that create oxygen and grow our plants and, and colonize the moon. That's much closer. We can get to the moon in a week, um, but we can't get to another planet that has any sense of being similar to ours in less than hundreds of years. So it's, it's an interesting idea but it'd be really, really difficult. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, guys? Me. Okay, so there you go. Uh, uh, um, I want to ask, uh, how long do you think uh, it will take for a vaccine of COVID uh, to be developed? Yeah, it's a really good question. Actually, all of your questions are really good, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, this is something that the global community has to get right. So while there is a race to develop a vaccine, there is also a process that has to be followed. So the, the good news is that we have two species that we know we can test this virus in and test vaccines in. Uh, one is a cat, the other one is a ferret. We can't seem to work with mice just yet because we can't infect mice um, with the virus. So there is a process right now of testing different vaccines in these animal models. And that will take a few months to see one, um, can they infect this animal? And then can we treat it with a vaccine and see if it provides immunity? That takes a while. From there, 
we then test it in a small number of people. And uh, this is the process. There's a three-step process toward a vaccine. We might get 50 people and we just um, give them the vaccine to make sure that it doesn't kill them, okay? If it survives okay. that process, it then goes on to the next phase, which is a small number of people. So now we know that the vaccine is safe. Now we're gonna to go to a thousand people and we're going to see uh, half of them will get the vaccine, half of them will not, they will get what's called placebo. And we will test to see who gets infected and who doesn't. This is how drugs are tested. So we know whether they are effective or not. If there is success in that small group, then we test it in different parts of the world with tens of thousands of people. And test then, again, with vaccine and placebo to see whether this vaccine works. So just thinking about that process should help you understand that we cannot do this quickly. And vaccines are very um, tricky because what you're doing is you're actually getting injected with the virus a little bit and hoping that your immune system builds up an immunity that would keep a bigger dose of that virus from making you sick. We have a lot of people that are skeptical about vaccines in general. And so if we put a vaccine on the market that kills people, it will undermine people's trust in vaccines of all kinds. And then we'll have even bigger problems. So to answer your question, we will have a vaccine in 12 to 18 months. And that is, is about as fast as we can go. So a year to 18 months before we have a vaccine that we trust enough to start inoculating people around the world. But does that, do you understand now why it takes so long? Science needs to be very careful because if we lose faith in science, boy, we can't fight this thing at all. And Justin, may I just add on Fedori's question? Uh, because he asked about vaccines, but we also, uh, we have heard um, about different um, drugs that were used, well, failed drugs for like Ebola um, that now um, are being considered as a treatment for COVID-19. Yes, so um, so right now we, were, we are likely to get drugs that will work uh, in some people, maybe not all people, sooner than a vaccine. We understand how uh, the body responds to this virus. And essentially what happens is that it, 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 it turns on your immune system at the highest possible level. And that's good. The problem is, as your immune system starts to reduce the, num the amount of virus in your body, the immune system doesn't shut down and it doesn't slow down. It continues to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And this is why older people are dying. They're not dying from the virus. They're actually dying from an immune response that's causing great, great swelling and inflammation in their lungs. And so they can't breathe. So the drugs that we are trying to develop are to be given about a week after you have symptoms as a way of um, suppressing your immune system. And those are the drugs that are being tested right now because they work in people with malaria and they work in people with a, with a disease called lupus that need this immunosuppressant. But right now the existing drugs don't appear to be working on COVID-19. So 
doctors are trying to change those drugs a little bit so that they will work against this virus. And again, it's the same kind of testing process that they need to go through. But it's not just getting the drug, it's knowing when to take the drug. And that's the tricky part. So we, if we have people taking this drug before they are infected, it's the worst thing they could do because then they won't have an immune response at all. But I think we will have drugs probably within less than six months that will be effective for a lot of people. The vaccine is going to take longer. Okay, thank you. Okay, guys, maybe one last question because we, we've run out of time. Does anybody else want to go? No one? Okay, I'll, I'll have then the last question. Okay, so um, Justin, just so that we can um, um, close this conversation with a more um, optimistic um, message to our students, um, what would you have to um, um, tell them about how we should um, behave during this process and how they should um, approach their education right now? Because right now most schools are closed down. Some schools are able to provide distance learning online. Some others, actually most schools don't do that or don't do it on a very large scale. Um, and this might take a while, but we, for, for, the, for our students who have access to distance learning, what, what would be your, um, your guidance, your, your, you know, any suggestions? Yeah. So I, I have this challenge with my own students at the university where I, where I teach, and it's absolutely essential for all of you, as it is for my own students, to continue their education because this pandemic will not last forever. We, it's, we, will, we will move through this in six months to a year. It, it's, it, it could, could be that long, but we will move through it. And one of the things that will help us move through it is maintaining whatever kind of normal life that we already enjoy and, and, and appreciate. And education at your age is one of those things. So if you have access to uh, online education, I would ask all of you to take that as seriously and as enthusiastically as you would if you were going to school. It's different. There's no question about that. It, it's, it's horrible to have to stay home all day. <laughs> I'm bored a lot of the day, you know, I can't wait for my next class. But I also know that we're gonna get through this. We'll get back to normal and we don't wanna fall behind. But mostly for you guys, understanding the science of what's happening is the thing that will give you hope. Because, they're, because we, are, we are learning so much more about this disease every day. And as we learn more, we learn how to stop the spread and how to treat it and how to get to a vaccine. And uh, that's where education and knowledge can bring us hope. So you have a great, great teacher uh, who has invited you, invited me to this class today. And why would you not want to spend time with her? Why would you not want to have the benefit <laughs> of her knowledge and her enthusiasm? You guys are lucky. Thank so, you, Justin. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, um, okay, so guys. I, have, I mean, it's just critical. Thank you so much, Justin, for being here with us today and for spending so much of your time to talk to our students. And it's been a pleasure as always. And um, guys, I think we should all turn on our cameras and say thank you to Justin. I think that's the most polite thing to do. So do please. I'm gonna also turn on my camera. So. Don't turn on your microphones, this way, but just turn on the cameras. Hi guys, haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, Justin. Thank you, that was amazing. And um, hopefully we'll be able to talk to you soon thank again. You.
Davi, invite me anytime. I will make the time for your students anytime. Thank you. Thank you. You guys had great questions. Good luck with your education and good luck in Greece. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Say goodbye Bye -bye. to Justin. Thank, Thank you, you, Justin. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.